All right. So here we are. This week's episode looks a little bit different. Our regular CAF Forward Tube host, Steve Bus, is on a much deserved vacation after announcing at EAA's Air Venture in Oshkosh. Um, so we hope he's having a fun time relaxing. And in the meantime, you've got me. Um, my name is Leah Block. I'm the Vice President of Marketing for the Commemorative Air Force. Usually, when I attend these webinars, I am behind the scenes. Um, and I'm monitoring all of the comments and questions and streaming and stuff like that. Um, but this week, I am not. So here I am. Um, and I'm very excited for a wonderful guest we have this evening. Her name is Dr. Raquel Ramsey. Um, and she is going to tell us a fascinating story. Um, we're very, very happy to hear from her today. Um, and I hope that you guys enjoy the story that she's about to share with us. So welcome so much. Um, Raquel, welcome to the CAF Warbird 2. Um, and this is your first time, hopefully first of many, but we're gonna talk today about some very important people um, to you. So why don't you explain to us who these two people are and what their relationship is to you? First of all, I am honored to be part of the commemorative Air Force and to be able to tell the story of my sister-in-law, Nadine Ramsey. There she is on the cover of Life magazine. And on the right is my husband, Colonel Edwin Price Ramsey, 26th Cavalry Philippine Scout, when he was decorated by General Douglas MacArthur amid all of the havoc and chaos in Manila. This was on June 13, 1942. So this was, to me, these two pictures are iconic. She with her plane and he, both of them war heroes, and he with his congressional gold medal, which he will receive later, but right now it's the Distinguished Service Cross. So I thought that this was a great way for you to begin the story because this is a real story of a family, the Ramsey family, that I'm so proud to be part of because I am her sister-in-law and he is my husband. And he asked me to write the book because he said she had more guts than he ever did. And I said, honey, that's not possible. You were there four years behind enemy lines, forming the guerrilla forces, which became what special forces is today. And you led the last horse mounted cavalry charge in US army history. And he said, just watch. When you start unraveling her story, you will learn why. And I learned why after three years of this research and putting the book together with a formidable group of people. And that so, is, yes. Okay, so I, I clearly what we've determined here is that there's two very compelling stories to tell. Um, and today we're going to focus on Nadine Ramsey, but I, I, I couldn't help but to throw this in there, which is um, her brother, Ed Ramsey, your husband, Ed Ramsey's story, which is, you know, getting in a movie, it's in a book, it's in a movie. Um, it's that good. So we couldn't, <laughs> couldn't go <laughs> forward without saying, no, we know this is a great story too. We'll go back to it. But for now, um, we're going to focus on Nadine. So just, you know, we don't have to go too deep, but what's, what's happening here with this story? And then we'll, we'll put a pin in that and come back to that um, on another day. Okay. So my husband passed away on March 7, 2013, buried in Arlington with full military honors because he, he received this Distinguished Service Cross on June 28, 2013. Right after that, Vanilla Fire, the gentleman beside me, Stephen Barber, approached me about making the movie on Ed. And this is Never Surrender the Ed Ramsey Story. And I became executive producer. 
Behind us is General Douglas MacArthur. Of course, it was Robert Tidwell playing the role and all the Philippine scouts. And right there is the other <coughs> producer of Vanilla Fire. So that, that is awesome. And, and we will go back to that. But um, so you're coming to us tonight really to talk about a book that you wrote um, about your sister-in-law. So here is, is an, a shot of the book and you wrote it with somebody else. Um, so earlier when you talked about your team, um, she's obviously a member of your team that helped you write the book. So this is Trisha who helped write the book with you, correct? Yes, Trisha Orrund. She writes as a screenplay writer, two-time also nominee, Academy Award nominee. And uh, I actually met her through Steve Ravel, who was the co-author of my husband's book, Lieutenant Ramsey's War. And he told me, I've got a prodigy, Trisha Orant, and she would be terrific to work with you. And then she was doing the screenplay, working with him, on Lieutenant Ramsey's war. And so I saw her writing and my gosh, the pages just jumped out. And I said, she's terrific. So we got together here at home and she said, I love Nadine. And she was hooked into the story. So she has done a fantastic job of making every page more interesting than the one you just read. And I'm very grateful to have her of course, as my co-author. But aside from that, I have my son, Doug Ramsey, who's always there beside me, calls me every night at 7.30. Doug Ramsey is the, uh, the uh, ITT director of San Diego, University of, of, of uh, San Diego. Uh, and he just retired. And actually, they called him back. And so he is an expert in terms of writing because he was in a managing editor of, of uh, Newsweek. I mean, he has a stellar career in journalism, plus being on camera for NBC and in other networks. So having him working with me, being a great, you know, I would say rock as we were going through, and then having Shelly Kale. Shelly Kale was the editor of Ed's book, Lieutenant Ramsey's War. And so she worked on research. She worked on publishing. She has done her own uh, itinerary that she has, which is fantastic. So this was a great team that we had together. Three years in the making till September That's 3. Amazing. <laughs> lots of research, lots of stories. So we'll dig in and let's start with Nadine. So she was born in 1911, a Kansas girl. Um, tell me a little bit about her, her very early years in Kansas. Well, she was a rambunctious child, just like Ed. <laughs> I always say Nell had two rambunctious children, okay? And they were all aiming high, as General Levitt would say. I mean, she loved to fly and he loved the horses. So mom thought, oh my gosh, before my child would become a juvenile delinquent, I'll put him in the military academy. And that's where Ed went. And of course, he had a fantastic career in the military and uh, with Oklahoma Military Academy. Nadine, on the other hand, wanted to fly. So here she is taking flying lessons. And this picture is her first solo flight aboard a Velik Monikoop. And she did this in six hours. She was really outstanding. And she always teased Ed that he should get into flying because the war was coming. She sort of knew the clouds that were surrounding the world at that time. So she she became a pilot when very, very few women were becoming pilots. Um, and I have this, this photo here. She became a commercial pilot in 1937. So I, I did a little research. Um, and as of 2020, only 8% of the licensed pilots in the country, in the US, according to the FAA, only 8% are women. So you 
can only imagine wow. what that number was in 1937. So she is definitely, um, she's, you know, a, a character, if not scandalous, she's at the very least a character, but probably quite scandalous. Um, and, and, you know, and she went on to get her commercial license, which says she's committed, you know, she is, she's going for it. She loves it. And this is what she wants to do, which I have to commend her for, um, you know, just knowing what she wants to do at a young age and going for it. Absolutely. And I tell you, Ed would say the story about her being a stunt and racing pilot. And she really looks dapper Dan on that outfit of, as an aviator. But that was her love. That was her passion. And I am so amazed at a woman ahead of her time. And that's why I nominated her to the Pioneer Hall of Fame of the Women in Aviation for 2022. Yeah, I think, I think she's, she's an excellent candidate. Um, so another story um, about Nadine, which is pretty fabulous, was she was one of the first women to deliver mail for the U.S. Post Office. Um, it, I, it looked to me like there were, there were only two early women, but she was really the first um, to fly for the U.S. Post Office, which is very, very cool. So in this photo, there's the Postmaster General. This is the 20th anniversary of the U.S. Air Mail. And here she is flying in a Taylor Cub from Wichita to Wellington, Kansas. And beside her is mom, Nell, so proud of her daughter, May 1938. So she's there on the limelight. So here comes the news people. And she's right there on front page news. I mean, you know, the woman who flies the airmail. And uh, that's another kudo to her, you know, a feather in her cap. Absolutely. And then this I found, which just it yes. cracks me up. <laughs> if, you, if you look closely, um, you know, if you're only listening to this, this episode, it, it says, it's a certificate. It says, known by all men, by these presents, that in recognition of his service and in appreciation of his cooperation, this certificate is presented to, and then her name is written in, Nadine Ramsey. Um, and, and it goes on and they fill in the dates um, and where she's flying to and from. And then it, it's almost like they realize at the bottom of the certificate that it's a woman. <laughs> so there's a, there's a sentence that says, he performed it in a most satisfactory and commendable manner, transporting the mail with certainty, clarity, and security. And they, he put, a, whoever wrote this put an S in front of he, so it would be, <laughs> but it's handwritten. And I yes. just, it's, <laughs> this You're very perceptive. Up. You're very it, perceptive, Leah, about catching that. That's fantastic. <laughs> It is so interesting, you know, that, mm -hmm. you know, at that time, the, the assumption was it was going to be the pre-printed certificate that he and his and him. Um, and mm -hmm. so she's already, she's, she's making them scratch things out, right? Mm -hmm. from, <laughs> right from breaking, the start. breaking the barrier right there, you know? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, so it's about 1939, um, and she decides she's going to go out to California. So tell me a little bit about that move. Well, uh, she was beginning to see that aside from, you know, being in Kansas, and of course, uh, brother is in Oklahoma, but the winds of war are coming, and she decides to move to, the, uh, to California because there is a lot of aviation there. She was going to work in companies like Donald Douglas. I mean, they were all beginning to open up Rossi the Riveter, you know. This was the time women were going to play a role in aviation. So she thought, oh, this is a good place where I could land a job. And she goes to Taylor Craft uh, Aviation and she works there. And that was from 1939 to 1940. I love this picture of the three of them, so casual, right there, having a great time. They were really a threesome. Fantastic. 
Yeah, I tried to kind of pepper in some some family photos here so we could really get an idea of, of who she was as a person. Um, because I think it speaks to what she did um, for our country. So she, in 1942, she is, is starts, she joins the Civil Air Patrol. She, mm -hmm. you know, the Civil Air Patrol was allowing women to fly for them. And she, at this point, probably has a lot of flight time, um, especially for women. So she becomes um, a flight instructor here for the Civil Air Patrol. Yes. And you see in that photo, she is standing on the left. And on the right is B.J. London, who was her commander of the uh, ferrying command in Long Beach. But Nadine now was a flight instructor and she became the squadron commander. And these are all the cadets. So here she is training other women to fly like she did. I mean, I, I think this is a fantastic photograph and this uh, from the archives. Yeah, and that's, that's a pretty serious plane that they're flying there also. So I, I, I wish... I wish we could hear the story about that because uh, yeah. many people would love to fly that aircraft nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, there are, are not very many. Yes. Um, so let's go on to, you know, this, this major, major milestone in her life and, and what we probably know her best for, which is her um, participation in the WASP program. Mm hmm well, she became one of 85 pilots in the West, graduating in the class of 43-W-5 in September 1943 at Avenger Field in Sweetwater, Texas. As a matter of fact, the museum there is going to have a 80th anniversary of the West Museum next year. And so the Vanilla Fire team that did Never Surrender they're flying there to film the opening or reopening, I would say, of the museum because it was close, remodeled, you know, with COVID and everything. And they're going to invite the Wests, their families. So, so uh, the director there, Lisa, said to me, Raquel, this would be a terrific opportunity for you and your team to film there. And so that's coming up next year, April, May, 2022, for taking flight the Nadine Ramsey story in the documentary. That's awesome. And we've had Lisa on the show before. So I will echo those comments to you. If you are able to head on down to the National Watts Museum in Sweetwater, Texas, it's amazing. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it is a time capsule indeed. Um, if, if you go out there, you can only imagine what it would be like um, to be out there with um, training on these aircraft in deep, deep West Texas. Um, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Well, I have been there at Avenger Field with my husband. Not with the new, you know, this is when we were traveling on our motorhome in the 1990s. We went there. As a matter of fact, there was a sketch of Nadine on the wall. And so... Boy, did they make a lot of big changes there now. But uh, I have been there to the uh, Avenger Field in Sweetwater, Texas, with my husband, Ed. So that was very memorable for Ed and me. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So up oh, here, we, I think we got out of order here. Oh, let me go back. OK, here we go. Here we are. So this is a list that I got, and you can confirm or, or correct this. This is a list I got of the aircraft that she flew um, as part of the WASP program. And it is a very impressive list. Very yeah. impressive indeed. Yeah, I, it is, it's pretty amazing. Um, and I think she's, she's one of only 26 WASPs that flew the P-38, which, um, won her over. We'll find about that later. But did, do you recall having conversations with her about having access to these airplanes? Because that's, you know, we talk so much about the WASP serving their country, 
but I, I wonder if you really loved flying and you were passionate about aviation, this would kind of be awesome to try out these aircraft that were brand new. They were cutting edge, you know, mm -hmm. most of the time when the Wasp had them, they, they were right out of the factory. So they were some pretty jazzy planes they got to fly. Did she ever talk right. to you about that? Well, she talked about the P-51. That was also a, her favorite, but P-38 was her favorite. But she did not uh, chat a lot about her role. She just said, I love to fly, okay? And so she would talk about some of this aircraft, but not particularly mentioning that we know now they were the biggest military aircraft at that time. So she was handling all of them. And Ed would say, she taught men how to fly from bombers to fighters. That summarizes it all. She handled every plane and you did a great job of noting down all of those types of aircraft. <laughs> and I love this relaxed stage she is there right beside her plane. <laughs> Yeah, these are great. So it looks like she, oh, some women entered the, the WASP program and they didn't have nearly as many hours of flying as she did. So she, you know, probably, I, I don't know, I'm, it was a rigorous program, but she probably breezed through it given her, mm -hmm. um, you know, given her history in flying. Um, so when she graduates from training, she goes for the pursuit school. She goes for the fast aircraft. She goes, exactly. you, know, you can tell she, I guess you're either a fighter or a bomber person. She was a fighter person indeed. So mm. she, she went that route so she could go um, and fly on the fighters. Mm -hmm. and, and that is a fabulous photo of her pursuit school, 1944. Just a smiling out from the cockpit. <laughs> Um, so, okay, so she gets assigned to Love Field in Dallas, Texas, mm -hmm. um, and she asked to go to Long Beach, California. So here it is. She wants to go back to California, and she ends up with a six-faring group in, in Long Beach. Um, mm -hmm. And this, what can you tell me about this picture, what, what these, these girls did at this time? Well, I'm going to tell you three interesting people here aside from her. Well, she's on the left, standing on the left side. And on the right side is her commander again, B.J. London. But right in front here, kneeling in the middle, is Iris Critchell. One of the eight women that you will see later assign the painting of uh, the, uh, the, the painting done about the wasps and so she was also very very involved and she's a still alive iris critchell and she is so thrilled about my having written nadine's book and uh so she was at every wasp get together and that was another very dear friend that she has so all of those women outstanding in the field of ferrying command this is the ferrying group now, sixth ferrying group. So they would bring the planes to the area where the men would take them to go to war. So this was an essential element that women played. Without them being able to transport the aircraft, the men would have to be going to where the planes were stationed and have to fly them from there to go to war they facilitated that entire thing and yet they were not veterans and that's really where you begin to see women with a passion of flying but women with patriotism they wanted to serve the country and they did it on their own with their own money with their own energy and uh just love of country that is, to me, what makes them more outstanding than anything because of the sacrifice that they gave for this nation. And yet they were not recognized 
till now when they finally got the congressional gold medal in 2010. And I, I think it, it should be pointed out too that they, they really did fly everything. So, you know, you hear about, you know, oh, I was a P-51 pilot or, oh, I flew the B-17, but these girls flew everything. Every, they, everything. They really, they had to be extraordinarily talented in Bristol and, and really just learn quickly because these were pretty new aircraft. Yes, yes. And, and, and uh, what was interesting is that in the process of them doing all this flying and all, they never thought for themselves. They always were thinking of the role that they played. I'm doing this for the country. I'm doing this for the greater good because they were not even paid for it. I mean, you know, they were a misly salary where they had to buy their own uniforms and everything. So when you think about that and you compare it to today, I mean, it is really a far cry. It is pure sacrifice. And uh, they had the guts. No wonder Ed said she had more guts than I ever did. <laughs> this is when I saw the guts because they were flying pretty sophisticated military aircraft. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm sure I'm sure it wasn't easy. I'm sure they had lots of cat calls and things like that all along mm -hmm. the way. Um, yes. but their but their involvement really paved the way. Even even after the, the WASP program was disbanded, it, it was established that the women could fly. Mm -hmm. um, they they made that happen and even though the program disbanded over time. Um, you know, you see women continue to enter into the military and, and many of them speak to, you know, standing on the shoulders of the WASP um, and, and but for their participation in this program and, and the program happening at all, they wouldn't have the opportunities that they have today. Um, and one person in particular um, that you see here um, spoke to that, I believe, in your book. Yes, Major General Jeannie Levitt. She is an outstanding F-15 pilot. And the story she told me when we met through FaceTime, she said to me, I'm so honored that you asked me to write the foreword to your book. Because when you received the Congressional Gold Medal, I was at the back of the room. I didn't even know who she was. And she said, I was just watching and saying, this are the women who opened the door for us. And that is why she writes here, my journey as an Air Force fighter pilot would not have been possible if it were not for the incredible women who went before me, beginning with the WASPs. I hope readers will draw from Nadine's example, the strength to be bold, dream big, and believe in themselves. Readers should be inspired to believe nothing is out of reach. Aim high. Major General Jeannie Levitt, United States Air Force. I mean, and she's the commander of Randolph Air Force Base. Yeah, so I am amazing. just oh, elated. And she said, I am so happy that you asked me because I am so proud of doing this because of Nadine. Oh my God. That gave me goosebumps when we had our, our meeting together and the producers will be interviewing her for the documentary. And she wants to be interviewed at the West Museum. She said, no, not here in my office, in the West Museum. That just tells you how much respect and admiration she has for the Wasps. Well, she's an outstanding person herself, my goodness. Wow. <laughs> so this is, can you explain this one? Yes. All right. So this is the P-38 Lightning. And I would like to uh, read a few uh, lines from the book about this plane. Because to me, this was the highlight of her career. Actually buying her own P-38. So when they do questions in terms of trivia, who is the only woman who owned her own P-38? The answer is Nadine Ramsey. Can you believe that? 
And that's what got her on the cover of Life magazine, which was the other photograph we showed before. So I will read this passage. Beginning in the spring of 1945, surplus warplanes were ferried to sail centers across the country, some of them by former WESPs. The aircraft ran the gamut from war weary and damaged to those with fewer than 100 flying hours. In early February 1946, Nadine learned that nearly 500 P-38 Lightnings were for sale at Storage Depot Number 41 of the War Assets Administration, formerly the Kingman Army Airfield in Kingman, Arizona. There, thousands of war surplus and decommissioned aircraft were lined up in rows across 4,000 acres of desert, waiting to be turned into scrap metal. The lightnings, which had each cost 115,000 to make, that's more than 1.6 million in 2020 dollars, were going for $1,250 per plane, less than 18,000 in 2020 dollars. A P-38 at that price was a steal, but on her instructor salary, Nadine didn't have that much money readily available. She knew her brother would understand her reason for buying a P-38, so she called Ed and asked for a loan. When he heard what she wanted, she laughed and said, yes. On Valentine's Day, Nadine went to Kingman and found the plane of her dreams. She bought it on the spot, making her P-38 one of only 10 planes that were ultimately purchased in Kingman. She flew it back to Long Beach the same day. Sure enough, Nadine's purchase made the news. On February 15th, the Los Angeles Times printed a two-column article headlined, Woman Goes Shopping, Flies Home with P-38, noting that while most women are still waiting for their post-war dreams of nylons, clothing, and household articles to materialize, Nadine Ramsey of 5300 Hanbury Street, Long Beach, had hers all wrapped up yesterday, only it wasn't a feminine item. Nadine, the reporter wrote, had stepped figuratively and actually into the stratosphere when she picked up a bargain at such a saving that womankind everywhere can envy her without reserve. She not only scored a neat victory over old bargain hunting competitors, but so far as is known, she became the first female civilian in the world to own outright one of the world's fastest airplanes isn't that amazing <laughs> so it's so interesting you know because it's it, they're still talking about a shopping you know they're still, they're right, still exactly. trying to pigeonhole her um it, you know it's just it, it's what they did so she um she called this aircraft lucky lucky and yeah. I, I think we've got let's see i think we've got another picture we should have another picture here but it looks like it's missing so let me stop sharing my screen really quickly and, and find the other pictures mm -hmm. um if you could just talk talk a little bit about what she did next with lucky well i would read to you the continuation of the passage the following day the dayton herald verified the claim girl purchases p38 and she can handle it the headline said, adding that Nadine was the only girl in the world today to own a P-38, one of the twin engines, twin-tailed, single-seater fighter planes that were the curse of the German Luftwaffe. And there is a, a photograph of her walking on her a P-38, and that came from uh, Peter Stackpole. But the photograph you were looking was the one at the very beginning where you showed her leaning over, and that was from the cover of Life magazine. And that's from the Life magazine cover. The first photograph we had with her and beside was Ed. So that was the P-38. So this is, um, this is where she is 
going to participate in 1946, she registered to participate in the Transcontinental Bendix Trophy. Yes, race. yes. And, and this was another amazing feat, making her the first woman here in the photograph. Uh, there is the aviation engineer working with her on the plane. And then she, this was for the Bendix race, transcontinental. And again, another first for her, being the first woman to fly the ben, in the Bendix race. I mean, she was really a pilot to the height of being a pilot. Not just flying planes, I'm having fun. No, she always aimed high, which is exactly what Gerald Levitt was saying, you know? This women have that uh, guts, that impetus, that passion that we want to excel. And for her, excelling was flying, you know, getting the toughest planes, the most well-known military aircraft, and I will fly, and then I will compete, just like she was doing the uh, stunt and racing pilot. So this is another kind of competition, but this is a big one because this is transcontinent, the Bendix race trophy. Mm -hmm. Right, but she didn't end up getting to fly in that race. Correct. Um, that, that, so this, I'm interested in, there's not a lot of information about what actually happened. I'm hoping you could shed some light on, on what happened here. Okay, so we surmise, and she was thinking that somebody sliced her tires. And that is why when she was getting ready to go, she was unable to fly the plane. And so there was sabotage. So this is another intriguing story. And it could be one of the competitors that could have done it. It's just like when you think about the skater, remember, where another one slashed her, her, her leg. My goodness. Mm -hmm. So there was mm -hmm. competition with the women because... She felt, they felt that she is really a win. And she said, I'm getting that $2,500. Can you imagine the value of that today? My goodness, to get that. And then turns out she can't fly because the tires are all slashed right on race day. So this was really a very uh, disappointing day for her. But it yeah. also showed that it's okay. All right. Somebody is trying to show that I am a competitor because you wouldn't do that if you are be sure of yourself, you know? So you so do that. That, that was her food. attitude. Because the only picture I attitude. could really find was this picture, which I thought now I'm sure she, she's smiling in the picture. I'm sure she wasn't happy about it. But you're saying that she had a good attitude about it and was like, exactly. well, yeah. because they thought I was a threat. So. I was a threat. Exactly. You chose the right word, Leah. <laughs> if you are no threat to another person, they wouldn't touch you. But right. if you're a threat, wow, I got to stop that person from going onto the flight. And that's an excellent example. She's talking to the engineer there. Oh, you chose a right one to express what had happened, you know, the behind the scenes. <laughs> Good for her for having that kind of attitude because I, I, I would have been just beside myself. But so given what's going on in her life, you know, post-war, um, a lot of women are getting back into the, you know, back into the home. They're, you know, not working anymore. The men have come back from war. You see a lot of people becoming homemakers, which is, you know, a great decision that a lot of people made, but she didn't go that route. So she she went, went a different direction. And, and we've kind of learned that a lot of wasps did the same, you know, just because the war was over didn't mean they weren't gonna fly anymore. Um, you know, a lot of them tried to find ways to keep flying. So, so tell me what Nadine did um, so that she could stay in the aviation industry. Here is an interesting line, Leah, that I think the audience would like. After her withdrawal from the Bendix race, there was nothing for Nadine to do but to repair Lucky, 
She was in low spirits. Though some WASP had suffered accidents due to sabotage during the war, the idea that someone would want to harm a pilot such as Nadine during peacetime was puzzling and frightening. Neither Nadine nor Ed, who had stayed on with her in Southern California, could understand the situation, and they were upset by its injustice. But what does she do? She picks herself up, and I'm going to continue. I'm going to work now and work in an air company, airline company that sells planes, okay? So here she is, 1948. She sells her P-38 to buy a stock of aircraft parts and created her own company. And that was Aircraft Enterprises in Long Beach. Wow, you dust yourself off and you pick up and you're on the road again. Nothing brings her down. My gosh, you learn lessons from that about life. If life gives you a punch, you get up and you say, I'm okay. I can do this. Right. And that's the kind of person she was. Now I understand what Ed meant. I'm getting very emotional because I can basically see her. And it's like, I'm okay. I can do this. And that was the same way Ed was. But he, to see his sister being able to do that, that's why he said she had more guts than I ever did. Every time she got down, she got up again, you know? <laughs> That's a wonderful, wonderful passage, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so what, what do we have next? Oh, I'm going too quickly now. All right, so let's see. So now we have the WASP get veteran status, albeit many, many years later. So mm -hmm. in 1977, they were granted veteran status. Um, mm -hmm. And the certificates they received in 1979 were post-dated, which is, I find interesting to have a post-dated <laughs> military certificate. Um, right. it, it, so, it, you know, it, it even says right there, this is an important record, but we're going to fudge the date a little bit. So, mm -hmm. exactly. <laughs> but, yeah. um, but they did finally get some recognition that was, was her feeling about that you know, relief? Was she relieved? Was she proud? Was she, you know, ambivalent? Because, you know, her, her, she wasn't in it for the recommend. The, yeah, she the really fear. wasn't there for recognition. And that's the reason why she could take it. If you were there because you expected, you know, you almost gave your life to this career and they were not even recognizing you for what you did then you really feel so down. But she did it because she wanted to do it for the country. So in that way, she accepted the injustice. She was hurt, but she moved on. You know, that's how life is. And of course, so now in retrospect, they're giving this certificate. So thank you very much. But uh, it's another thing to put into my uh closet <laughs> and 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 keep it you know finally you get your certificate you are recognized as a veteran but it's hurtful and that also to her what was more hurtful is that she was not given more time to be doing this flying for the military because they they close shop you know 1944. Bye bye. We don't need That's you so anymore. That's interesting. So she was more, she was more offended by closing the program than than not being equal footing. That was the real burn for her. Exactly. And that's exactly. that's fascinating. Yeah, that was really what it was for her because she saw all of her other female pilots not being given, not treated rightly. To her, it was the closing of the program that was so painful because they would not be able to continue their mission. That's what she wanted. And there she is. You found the photograph. That's the one in the Arlington National uh, Memorial honoring her. And that's right there 
you you put it it's on a large screen you can open that as you enter arlington national uh women's memorial and it's right beside arlington cemetery so ed is buried in arlington national cemetery and she's on the screen because the women could not be buried in arlington so she is there on the screen right beside him i mean this is very poignant to me you know both of them in arlington and here she is with the congressional gold medal this was the one she received in 2010 and i kept her her scarf and her card and that is one of the treasures i have in my mini museum that's that's wonderful so we we now know we had a guest on a couple weeks ago who fought to have her grandmother buried at Arlington National Cemetery, who was a wasp. So mm -hmm. now they can, but, but then they couldn't. Um, do you think it would have meant a lot to her to be buried there? Not really. She no. wanted her ashes scattered. That's exactly what happened. She had her ashes scattered in Long Beach. That's how much she loved Long Beach. Right there on the waterway, Ed, took it on a helicopter and sprinkled it as she wanted. That's where she wanted to be buried in the waters of Long Beach. She's a true Long Beach, California girl. She's Wichita and she's Long Beach. So one of the articles that was written by uh, Rich Archbold honoring Nadine, now when the book came out was, here is a native of Long Beach. Oh my God, that story was so wonderful. It just came out January of 2021. And you can see a lot more of those in her website. All the book reviews are there. Great, yeah, we've, we've got um, the website coming up, but um, I wanted to take just a minute and talk about you know the family um, yeah. because I think it's important what they did, but they could only do what they did because of who they were. And, yes. you know, while it is important to remember Nadine's, you know, flying abilities and her participation in the WASP program, um, you know, what can you tell us about the real, you know, the real Nadine, who she was as, as a person? Um, you know, we, we looked at this picture earlier and you titled it Love. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Love Absolutely. in 1945. Mm -hmm. um, and this, I, to me, I, I love this picture too, because I think you can really get a sense of how close this family was and yes. how, um, how, how passionate they were about life. About life. That's very true. And I thought that you selected a great photograph there because that's one of my favorite photographs too. Here is Ed coming back from the war. They thought he died. He was MIA, missing in action. And here's a mother waiting year after year. Here's a sister waiting year after year. And one of the letters that I found written by Ed, of course, he was able to come back. That's why the letter was, was found, said, if the war goes on, I will never surrender. And that is, it's either I die or I die fighting. That's the kind of man he was. But he said, I love you, Nadine and Nell. And that would be the toughest part for me about leaving you. In this letter, I cried all night when I found it and covered it from a box. And the producers of Vanilla Fire said, Rocky, we want that to be the title of the film, Never Surrender. And it was so appropriate. It was the love that he had for them. It was the love they had for him that kept him going. And all three are just to me so wonderful. What a family tied together through love. So really, the label for this, as I said, is love. He comes back, look at the faces, joy. And there is Nadine playing the organ. As a matter of fact, that organ is still existing. 
And, and uh, she was playing the Baptist church in Wichita, Kansas. There is a photograph of mom and Nadine relaxing. And there is me with Nadine and Ed at Marlora Manor in Long Beach when we visited her every week when she already had so many uh, accidents because she had crashes on, you know, with her plane flying. And then she developed pain in her back and all. And this is our ritual. Every week, Saturday, we will come and visit her. And then we would go to have hamburgers in her special place. And BJ London, who was her best friend and commander, would also be with us. And there's another photograph with her. But this one you chose so perfectly. There's Nadine and there's the two of us. And oh I just God. want to point out, if, if the audience has not seen it, it, she's playing the organ and she has airplane models on, on the yes. organ and yes. in the background. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Which, I'm sure that we can all relate to decorating our house with airplane models. So I just, I, I thought it, it, it even looks like the P-38 is on a doily, which I think is fantastic. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you, the B-17, her husband flew, Jack Gardner. So, and he wow. made those models himself. So these were made by her husband. And of course, they were the best pieces to display with her organ. <laughs> that was very perceptive of you. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, mm -hmm. pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So since then, you, you've written a book. Tell us what's going on when the book was released, the book is on tour, and, and there's some talks about making a movie. What, what's next for, for the story? Okay, so Taking Flight Now uh, has been, in spite of COVID, with no in-person signings, I signed 130 copies. They have sold 750 copies, the University of Kansas Press, and I am doing like here, a webinar with you. I just did a presentation with Tricia with Texas Women's University. We're scheduled for March with the National World War II Museum as another webinar. So we have had military organizations. I have made presentations. And then to me, it is to carry the story. This is my mission. I retired after 50 years from Beverly Hills Unified School District. And my mission is to carry my husband's story and my sister-in-law's story. Can you imagine the pride that I have that I can talk about two wonderful people who are my relatives? And of course, mom. Mom Nell was a woman ahead of her time too. That's why I dedicated the book to all of them because she was a dermatologist, 1800, and she had her own clinic at the Lassen Hotel. So this story will unfold as a movie. And this is a documentary, just like Ed had Never Surrender, Vanilla Fire, you will see Stephen Barber there, Matt Housley, and two-time Academy Award nominee and winner of the Emmy, Jay Miracle. In fact, we just had a conference call last week about how to proceed with uh, Jane Seymour as our narrator, because for Never Surrender, we had uh, Josh Brolin. So now we have Jane Seymour, and we were supposed to have lunch at her home in Malibu, but then COVID hit, she got trapped in uh, England, and of course, I couldn't get out of the house. <laughs> so, so that all went. And this is now one year. And we're trying to pick up the pieces to be able to make this a reality. That's my next project. Well, Taking flight. We're looking forward to watching story. it. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, well, we're looking forward to seeing what's coming up next. And I just wanted to, before we run out of time, um, tell everybody the website, which is NadineBRamsey.com, um, that people can go to to buy the book, see some of these great photographs, um, 
contact you, learn all different kinds of things, and, and hopefully soon we'll get updates on what's going on um, with the movie coming up. Yes, absolutely. And I will keep you posted on everything. And one thing for sure, you will be invited to the premiere of <laughs> Taking Flight, the Nadine Ramsey story. <laughs> As a matter of fact, your name was bantered around because they are looking at the people that are going to be playing roles and in interviews for the documentary. And right. so I will keep you posted on everything and you will be involved. That's for sure, <laughs> Leah. I am so thrilled to be with you today. Yes, it's been, it's been a wonderful storytelling session. Um, I, I love hearing the stories of the people who were engaged in World War II and, and the common thread of their um, personal, personality traits and their characteristics. You know, they were humble, but they were bold. They were, you know, they were brave, but they were um, so uh, sensitive about everything also. So mm -hmm. I just, I, I love this story. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Um, I did want to point out some other um, people who we got pictures and information from, and that would be um, the 99th, the National Wasp Museum, Women in Aviation International, um, the Historical Wasp. Um, archives that is at Texas Women's University in Denton, Texas. Um, mm -hmm. The University of Kansas Press, who published your book, and the Nadine team, which you spoke about earlier, um, with Trisha and Shelly and your family members that were able to, to package this story and put it all together. So we really, really appreciate you coming and telling us this story. And we'll have to have you back again sometime to talk <laughs> about Ed, or perhaps we'll just do a whole show about scandalous things that happened at Air Races, because I think, I think, <laughs> I think we have some investigating to do to find we out who yes. uh -huh. I yes. want to know. I'm curious. Yes. Um, anyway, so Thank you everyone for joining us on this episode of CAF Warbird Tube. We will be back next week with the regular host, Steve Buss, and we appreciate your time and um, we'll see you around. All right, thanks everybody, have a good night. Thank you very much. Good night, Leah. Good night, good night. everybody. Bye now. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>